Solar PV Cast by Shift, a podcast exploring solar energy and the role it plays in improving our lives and our planet. Here's your host, Chris Palliser. Yes, it's another episode of the Solar PV Cast uh, brought to you by Shift. For all your solar and energy storage needs, make sure to visit shift.ca. Now, the pros far outweigh the cons when it comes to going solar, but there are some cons, and one of them being recycling of panels. It is cheaper to just chuck them in the landfill, but of course that is so bad for the environment, that's not what we want. Our guest today is addressing that very problem and finding a lot of success with it. I'm really excited to have on the program CEO and owner Green Clean Solar LLC, Emily O'Leary. Emily, thanks for joining the podcast today. Nice to be here. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, to start, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit about yourself, a little background. How did you get into solar? How long you've been in the game? Absolutely. So I've been in solar since 2016. And during that time, I had another business where we were mechanical installers. So our niche in the market was building solar carports, rooftops, and solar farms. So we were able to travel all over the country um, building these commercial size projects. And we were fortunate to work on some of the largest rooftops, some of the largest military bases, universities, um, had my GC license in five different states. So that's how I really got to learn solar is being out in the field and really seeing what it takes to build these type of projects. So fast forward, um, we decided to sell the business in January of 2020 and uh, sold it to an oil and pipeline gas individual who wanted to get out of that space and get into renewables. And so I stayed on as the CEO for two years. And during that time, we started to go after utility scale projects. So we're looking at 50, 60, 100 megawatt projects. Big difference than what we were doing before. And as I mentioned, I like to have boots on the ground. I would go out, look at the job sites, and see the massive amount of waste that was happening at these job sites. And it's just the nature of the job. You know, you have tons and tons of packaging that comes with all the solar panels. And then you have tons and tons of broken panels that comes from installation, from the time they come off the trucks, some of them are broken. Um, you move them from the trucks to the lay down yard area, and then you move them into the site. Um, so there's many multiple points of where these glass panels can get broken. So I realized, you know, there's quite a bit of broken solar panels when you're on a job site of this magnitude. And nobody knew what to do with it, you know, and we didn't want to throw them in the landfill, um, but we didn't really have much choices because there wasn't very many options out there. So we were guilty of throwing not just the panels away, but a lot of the waste, the cardboard, the plastic, the metal, you know, we were in a very remote, I'm thinking of a specific project here, but we were in a very remote site and very, very limited resources. So that really motivated me to realize that we can't be the only company that's having this problem in our industry. Um, and I would talk to other colleagues and they had the same issue too. So fast forward again, um, I got out of that business and started Green Clean Solar in January of, or no, February of 2022. And just said, you know what, I've got to find a solution for all this waste. And so for over two and a half years, we have found solutions. We have gotten partners. We have done a lot of research um, in this area when it comes to recycling. And it's interesting because right around the same time I started my business, others were starting businesses with very innovative technology that could support this big problem in our industry. So we've collaborated. Um, we have probably one of the largest database in the United States because we work all over the country doing these type of projects. And what makes sense is to find partners near those sites because we don't want to haul it 
state to state, which sometimes we actually have to do because there's no local support uh, recycler in that area. So it's been really exciting journey. I absolutely love what I do. Every week or every day, we get new jobs with new material that we have to find a solution for. And we really do. We, we have been able to find some very creative options and different price points too, because a lot of times people want to do the right thing, but they didn't allocate certain funds to recycle. And as you said before, you know, it's, it's more expensive than throwing it in the landfill because you have manpower that has to go pick up the panels. You have to have consumables. You have to have trucks. And then you have to transport it to the facility. And they have manpower equipment and very expensive equipment. So there is a lot of cost to recycling solar panels and it's it's growing and I'm seeing a lot of very innovative technology um, from all over Europe and Asia that want to get into this space here in the United States because they know there's a lot of opportunities here. So I'm getting calls all the time that want to partner with me with this technology. So that gives you kind of an overview of where I was and what I'm doing today. Uh, what got you into solar initially, you know, when you, before you started that, was it just, you know, thought this is the way of the future. I want to get in on this. How, how did that, you just been following the solar world? No, absolutely. No, it's it's crazy because I have a, a background. Actually, I studied fashion in my undergraduate degree, and then I got my master's degree in business, and I've always been an entrepreneur. So I had a consulting business for many years, and I worked with a gentleman here in Atlanta, Georgia, that had a commercial uh, business. And so we partnered and I was supporting his business and he started to get into solar. Mm. And so this was back in 2014, 2015. And I saw the increase of solar projects with his business. And I was like, you know, this is really booming. And so we had a great talk as far as what we wanted to do in the future. And I kind of saw um, this increase. And I said, hey, let's start a business. That's all we do is focus on solar. So back in 2016, January 4th is when I came up with the LLC and just dove into it. I, ha I didn't know what a skid steer was. I didn't know much about the solar system and how it operated. I mean, I was learning, but um, started to go to a lot of trade shows. And we had one here in Atlanta and handed out business cards. And we got awarded a very big, uh, high profile project in downtown Atlanta, which is they were building the new Falcon Stadium, well, the Mercedes building. And a component of that was to have a renewable carport. So we got awarded to build that solar carport oh, wow. and it was beautiful. Like I drive by there now and I'm like so proud because I'm like, it's still functioning. It still looks good. Yeah. And it was a lot of lessons learned from building that site, but um, that really opened the door. So, wow. you know, when we That's did a cool. good job, it really, we started to travel all over the country doing other jobs like that. I uh, I remember re reading about the top ten stadiums in the U.S. that use solar power, and I believe that was one of them. It was the yeah the carport over the yeah that's really cool. I didn't know that. Well, congrats to to all your success in that and, and this journey so far. Now, obviously, uh, a female, a woman, in kind of a male dominated industry. You know, what was that part like for you? Well. I started cussing more. <laughs> I only say that because, um, you know, when you're in the construction industry, um, it can be very rough. You know, I went from corporate America with suits and high heels to work boots to khaki pants and using porta potties. I mean, there there's no glamour in the right. construction industry. So. Um, I had a couple of people tell me, Emily, if you're going to get into this, you need to have tough skin. And, and I realized that. Um, but I don't take things personally. You know, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. 
I've been cussed at and I just kind of, you know, let it go through one ear and out the other, but I can stand with them all. So, you know, I would still say, you know, 90% of my phone calls today are with men. Very few are women-owned businesses. I know a handful, and I'm so excited that they're in this space, but it still needs to um, expand. And, you know, I've got women working for me right now, and I think we're really good with multitasking. Um, we also see a lot of projects in a different perspective and how we can do things. So I can go to a job and I'll be like, you know what, we need to try this. And Typically, it works better that way. So I love to see women in this space, but it is challenging because, you know, some men are not used to showing up, having a woman on site, and they're like, well, who's the boss? And I'm like, well, that's me. That's who you're going to have to talk to. <laughs> so again, it's it's all good. I, I love what I do. Um, and there's good times and there's challenging times for sure. Do you, are you seeing, I mean, you said 90% of your conversations are still with men, but are you seeing more and more women, maybe at trade shows and other events, enter the, the world of solar? For sure. I really do. And I would say probably in the last um, five years, it has started to uh, create more interest um, for women because of these new jobs. So for example, you know, five years ago, you never heard of director of sustainability. Like that's a very new job title in our industry. And I'm seeing a lot of women hold those positions. And I love that because they can bring a lot of their experience from other work experience into that role. I'm seeing women in project management roles where they are tasked to see and execute projects from the very beginning to the end. I'm seeing women at trade shows that represent manufacturing, whether it's the manufacturing of solar panels, inverters, um, batteries. I'm seeing a lot of women in, in that role as well, being sales reps. I have very good friends that have gone completely from a different industry into those roles. So it's increasing a lot. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I love to mentor. Um, I'll give you one example. I'm working with the University of Georgia. Uh, this is my second year where uh, there's been women in their senior capstone classes wanting to get into this space. So I've been working with them on different um, opportunities. So I like to, you know, encourage them because it is, it can be very intimidating, especially if you don't know much about the solar industry. You know, they're like, we have no idea, but I didn't either. I mean, listen, if I came from a fashion background and I, if I can do it, anybody can. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, and, and congrats to you on being a bit of a pioneer uh, in that space. And like you said, you know, just if anyone can do it. You just buckle down and do it. So that's that's really cool. I, I love having conversations with anyone um, in the United States in general, really, because in Canada, uh, where we're based, the podcast, you know, the United States is kind of like our crystal ball when it comes to solar. Uh, you know, we're five, six, seven years behind the United States. And so it's pretty cool to kind of see that growth happen for, you know, 2015, 2016. They're putting it on big stadiums, obviously the Atlanta Falcons. And, and we don't have any stadiums with solar yet, uh, but we're, we're heading that way. And the same thing is for energy storage. We look at California a lot. So, yeah, I mean, what about the industry as a whole in Georgia? It's obviously booming still. It is. So what's interesting about Georgia is a couple things. Um, I have obviously done quite a bit of work in Georgia, um, but most of my work is outside of Georgia. And there are a couple of reasons why I, I would say South Georgia, we have a lot of cotton fields, a lot of peanut farms, and it's been saturated with utility scale projects. And what's happening is, from my understanding, is the grid is getting maxed out with so much solar. So I was down South Georgia about a month ago collecting solar panels and working with a good client and getting them recycled. And we had to bring them 
Um, there wasn't anything in South Georgia. I mean, when it comes to recycling, very limited resources. So that's the other challenging thing is that, you know, when all this boom of solar, you know, you have to have a lot of land, which means a lot of space, but there's not, there's, you know, your mom and pop shops. And if I go to them and I'm like, hey, you know, we have thousands and thousands of wooden pallets that we need recycled. They're like, well, we'll take a hundred. <laughs> we can't take that many. So anyhow, um, Georgia is still booming. I, I think there's a lot of really key players here in the state when it comes to solar. Um, we have Q-Cells, which many of you may know if you're listening. It's, I think, the number one North America solar manufacturer. Um, and they just expanded their facility in North Georgia. So we're really happy to have them. Um, SK Batteries is a huge manufacturing facility here. So our governor really supports innovation, technology. I know there's some really good tax advantages for some of these big time international companies coming to the U.S. and they pick Georgia. So it's it's growing um, in that fact. But I do see a lot of needs outside of Georgia. And so we go where the work is. And we've gone, you know, as far as Hawaii, Puerto Rico, California, Texas, up to Maine, New York, uh, Ohio, like we, we go everywhere. So potentially we, Canada. Yes. And so <laughs> I really want to, and actually we have a project that we're working on right now um, where we're trying to get the panels out of Canada to one of our partners to get recycled. So we working on the logistics and the border and what all that entails. So we don't get tariffs and taxes on kind of scrap panels because they're not coming to the U.S. to get resold. Um, so there's things that we have to find out. But I will tell you, Chris, my ultimate goal is to bring resources to Canada where we can do what we're doing here in the U.S. I mean, it's just a matter of getting a good location, getting um, support, you know, because these things are not cheap. So we need funding. And I'm sure there's organizations and government um, funding or grants that can support these kind of initiatives. So it takes time, though. The, these things don't happen overnight. But I'm the type of person that I like to see things get done so i i can move quickly <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and again you know the recycling of solar is not something major happening because again we're kind of you know five years behind where the united states is i think i read uh the u.s government invested something like 82 million dollars into figuring out recycling of solar panels last year a couple of years ago um whereas that's not really a thing yet on the radar right now we're we're looking at rebates and and support incentives to get people to install solar but it's kind of like a few years are going to go by and all of a sudden everyone's going to be looking at each other being like oh wait a minute yeah now we got to figure out what to do now because now we've got so many panels out there so it is happening in the sub provinces that have started uh, some free recycling programs like pilot programs um but yeah, there is an incredible opportunity. And, and obviously, that's why Green Clean is having so much success, because you're answering a, what is, you know, a, a negative of going solar is what do we do with the panels after the fact? Well, that and also, um, you know, we've been kind of focusing on the broken panels from installation. But uh, one pillar of my business is the decommissioning end of life. So we do have to start thinking long term because some of these sites that we're going to now, Chris, they're only 10 or 12 years old. They're not being in operation 25 years, like which is typically the warranty of the panels. They're getting taken down sooner than later. And why so, is that? Well, there's a couple reasons. I think they did their job, like they generated the energy that they expected when they put these panels out there. Um, some of the cables, like I was on a job site last week on a rooftop and, you know, having cables in the elements for a decade, they, they kind of start to crumble, you know, mm -hmm. like it was, it was kind of, I mean, this was a really solid system. Like it was beautifully done, but you really start to see a lot of wear and tear. And 
you know, the, um, the panels wattage were like 220, you know, right. and they're producing 600 watts right now. Yeah. And when you, you think, well, well, let's repower them. And these companies are like, no, we don't want to repower because that means newer inverters, newer cables, newer everything, you know, and sometimes the racking that was installed a decade ago, they're not necessarily going to be able mm -hmm. to handle the new panels. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the reasons that I'm seeing that they're coming down they the purchase power agreements are done and they're just they're done they they mm, just want them out and this is happening on big corporation buildings schools like you know ones that were really innovative a decade ago and they were like hey let's do this now they're like we're done we're done with right. it well and to your point the efficiency of or the, the wattage of the panels yeah 10 years ago it was 225 or whatever and like you said so now it's 600 so financially it probably makes sense to just rip everything out and if you're going to do it again put in a brand new setup to go another 15 years or, or whatever you have uh, and there's something that happened actually in alberta in the province of alberta in canada was they put a moratorium on large-scale solar alberta is kind of like the wild west of energy it's our texas if you will and um and so all of a sudden, people are popping solar farms on all this farmland and, and things like that. And they kind of said, well, hold on, we're going to pause this because we need to come up with a plan for end of life. Because, of course, in Alberta, everyone it was oil country. And now there's a whole bunch of abandoned oil derricks just strewn all about the province. And nobody's, everyone's kind of like, oh, yeah, it's not our problem. Kind of looking the other way, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to make sure the same thing doesn't happen with solar farms. So. You know, interesting to your point here about the large scale solar farms and what they're looking at. But then again, shout out to Green Clean for solving this problem, right? Well, I appreciate that. That's nice for you to say, because, you know, when there's a problem and nobody wants to come up with a solution, you'll see those vacant, you know, whether it's the oil machines or whatever, that people won't know what to do. And mm -hmm. what's also interesting is that, you know, I, one of the goals that I'm trying to do is, you know, obviously sell my services, but educate people, mm -hmm. because if you don't educate them, then they're not going to know what to do. And it's interesting because I've been getting phone calls from projects that we did years ago. They're like, Emily, we just saw you know, I'm trying to be on social media and I put posts on um, what we do because they're like, we didn't even know this was an option. And so I go back to the field and these panels have literally been sitting on the field for years and they're covered with water, like debris, weeds. I had at one, one of the sites had this huge wasp nest. I mean, you <laughs> obviously can tell that they have been there for years. Nobody but wanted like, to make the decision. Yeah. yeah they were like, we didn't know what to do with them. So we just yeah. left them here. I mean, they've got a great system producing energy in the back, but all these leftover panels. So I'm really trying to get the word out like, Hey, call us because you know, what we do is we offer a full service mm -hmm. turnkey, meaning it's not just the panels, those broken batteries, the inverters, like we did a power system out of Miami where we recycled over 5,000 lithium ion batteries that was taking down, but it had been sitting there because they had no idea how to process it. Because I will tell you, it's not easy, you know, and most of these companies that are building solar, like that's their strong point. They're not in the back trying to research and find out, hey, who can take this? Who can take that? Like, that's what we do. And that's what my team does. And it can take weeks for us to find the haulers, the recyclers, the trucking companies, you know, but we put all that together and we're like, okay, we can solve your problem. But it takes time to figure all that out. Do you find that people are are now willing to spend the money necessary to do this rather than just truck it to the landfill and be done with it? They're, they're, whether it's public pressure or education, do you find that they're willing to spend the money to pay for your services? Well, the good thing is, is I've been in business for two and a half years so because these clients have found money, right, yeah, to pay yeah. for these services. So it's like a 
you know, a, a pull and a tug type of deal. Like, you know, there's some companies when we send them an estimate, they're sticker shock or they go to crickets. Like what happened? You know, yeah, cause yeah. I think some of them don't expect some of these costs. And the good thing is we can say, Hey, let us help you. If you have a budget, we'll work with you, you know, because we have so many different options when it comes to recycling and they all have different equipment. They all have different processes. So one company may charge this and another company may charge this. So we really try to work with them and their budget. So the good thing is, is I think, you know, in certain parts of the country, especially the Northeast, they will fine them, the county, if they don't get rid of those panels. Like I had a call one day and the guy was like, we need you here tomorrow because they're going to charge us $10,000 a fee if we don't move these panels. So of course we get our team together and we make it, made it happen. But I do see some of the counties charging a very high fee if they don't do it. So this is another thing going back yeah. to educating our clients is like, look, you got to build this into your project. You know, you've got to definitely earmark money to recycling the, these panels or the end of life. And another right. thing that's we're, we're getting calls on is they can't even get permits unless they give get a end of life proposal. And those are one things that we're actually starting to develop a very comprehensive report on end of life. Like, I mean, nobody knows exactly what the cost is going to be in 20 years, but we have really good estimates that we can show you. Here's the cost, kind of what we are paying for today. So, you know, there's going to be money that's going to have to be earmarked for these type of projects. Yeah. And you're, you're so right. You know, we think, oh, these things will last 25, 30 years. We don't have to think about it, but we do. And, and so we have to start being proactive. It's interesting that the, the local governments are, you know, that's something maybe Alberta's looking at doing where it's like, okay, great. We support this, but we need to see a plan and what you're doing with this when it's done. Um, well, and here's another point I'll make with that. So there was a state um, government that called me and they said, Emily, we we're mandating this. And I said, oh, great. You know, more recycling of these solar panels. Well, guess what the problem was? These clients who had to recycle these panels, they're calling me. They're like, Emily, there's no place to recycle these right. panels. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So why would they implement this mandatory when there's no back end support, right? So That's we had government. to transport these <laughs> panels like to another state to get them recycled. Right. So I'm telling these legislation, I'm like, hey, I love the mandatory recycling, but look, before you do all this, please have some resources in your backyard that can accommodate that because if you can't do that nobody knows how to manage this yeah i mean that's that's a familiar problem as well in solar uh you know it's still so new and there's a lot of governments still trying to work their way through what this renewable energy world looks like and so it kind of makes sense that you know it's backwards but sometimes that's how the government works yeah and you probably have heard stories um uh, share a little bit about the wind industry, right? Like the wind turbine blades. I know that's big up in Canada and they didn't know what to do with those blades. So they started to bury them, you know, mm -hmm. and they just didn't know. So that's another industry that's starting to explode with options of recycling those wind turbine blades. So I'm really excited about that. We're starting to get involved with that as well too. But, you know, again, if people don't know what to do with it, they're just going to be like, uh, you know, we'll figure out yeah. something later. Yeah. What happens to like, do you ever think we'll get to a place where we no longer need to mine for these materials? Like when a panel is recycled, does it go back to more panels? Like what happens in that part of the process? Well, that's a good question, Chris, because there are recycling companies that have equipment now that can take out, um, the copper, take out the silver, they can melt the aluminum frames, they can uh, purify the glass, 
and then they'll sell those back into the solar industry. So I'm starting to see that happening. Um, but what's interesting is I also am starting to see a lot of the recycling companies that have been processing electronics for decades, right? They're like, hey, we want to get into this market. So a lot of their downstream buyers are wanting certain components of the panels, you know? So let's say their buyers have been in the automotive industry. Well, they may extract certain components of the panels that support their downstreams. Um, I know, uh, for batteries, for example, when we send the batteries to a recycler, um, they turn components of the battery into black mass, which then goes to produce new batteries. So it really all depends on the recycler and their downstreams and what they sell it to. Because I think that's really where they're making their money. They're not really making the money up front. They're really making the money on the back end. Right. And all parts of a panel can be recycled? Yes, from my understanding, yeah. um, yes, and again, it all depends on the equipment, um, and every equipment's different, and I'm seeing a lot of these equipments are coming from Korea, Thailand, China, um, I think those are the three main countries, and, you know, they are doing a lot in Asia, and they're doing a lot of recycling in Europe. So kind of what you were sharing, Chris, before, how you think Canada's behind the U.S. Well, the U.S. is really behind the recycling of panels from Europe. Like, they've been doing this for decades. So I'm seeing a lot of this new technology that's coming into the U.S. that can hopefully recycle everything from the panels. But here's the ch challenging thing. There are dozens and dozens of different type of panels, right? And that's the other thing. We're seeing new manufacturing of panels come into the U.S. And guess what? Their spec sheets is completely different mm. than the next spec sheets that right. I get. So I am seeing dozens and dozens of spec sheets, and they all have different elements in them. So those are things that we have to work with because some equipment are like, we can't take those. 100%, we can't take those. So then we have to find another recycler that can take those type of elements. So it's, yeah, I'm wow. telling you, it's a challenge. Yeah. Other challenges that you're finding in this, in this world that you're now in? Anything else that jumps out? Um, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of myths in our industry. And, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm not, I don't have a PhD in a lot of this stuff. So, you know, I hear stuff, I participate things. Um, I'm speakers at a lot of events. So I'm hearing a lot of different stories. And sometimes that gets trickled out to the field or to consumers or to businesses. And so there's just a lot of noise and a lot of, um, stories that I'm like, where did you get this from? You know, like I'm out in the field. I see this stuff, you know, so there's a lot of marketing and a lot of PR from companies that I'm like, what are they doing? Right. Because, you know, my crew and my team, we are literally out in the field doing this mm -hmm. every day. And so when I hear things like this, I'm like, you know, I'm just like, oh, goodness, yeah. this, this is not good. Well, so, that's the education element that you spoke to earlier, right? It is. It is. And, and it's interesting because it's not just happening in the U.S., but I'm also getting calls. Um, I've been invited to a big recycling uh, convention in Italy coming up here. And, you know, they have no idea of the challenges that happens with the solar growth, right? Like, you know, everybody has funding and money to pour into this and they build, build and build. And I will tell you one example, when I went to speak in Puerto Rico, 
they, you know, they've got these great goals by 2030 or 2040, they want to be 100% renewable. And so I'm up there and I'm telling them these stories. I said, well, you know, Puerto Rico being an island, I said, you know, we did this project and supported this in Hawaii, in Maui. And I said, you know, we had to process 93 thousand boxes, you know, that came in from a cargo ship. And they were like, oh, we've never thought about all this, you know, and I'm mm. like, this is a big problem, not just for the islands, but, you know, the landfill is, is overwhelmed with mm. all this waste. So I have to tell them, like, you know, I love that you're supporting all this growth, but are you thinking about all the waste mm -hmm. that's coming from all these projects? And they look at me like, oh, my gosh, you know. And then the other side of it is I go to these waste recycling companies or conventions, because I used to be going to solar all the time, but now I'm going to these waste recycling companies and I'm talking to the Glass Institute of America. I'm talking to the metal associations. I'm like, do you realize how much waste is coming from the solar industry? And they're like, we had no idea, you yeah. know? So again, I'm really trying to blend the waste, the recycling industries together to start talking. Because yeah. when I was talking to the Glass Institute America, I'm like, you know, would you take solar panel glass? And they're like, you know, because I mean, I'm sure that they process Coca-Cola bottles for decades, <laughs> right? Like they know how to process Coca-Cola bottles, but they've never processed solar panel glass, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of um, education it's, and yeah. research, research that has to be done on both ends. It's it's kind of society is in general. We're all so focused on getting that thing. We never think about what we're gonna do with that thing after. We just go on Amazon and click add to cart, add to cart, add to cart, and then we don't think about anything after that. So yeah, it's it's like a an uphill battle, but a battle that needs to be needs to be talked about on platforms like the podcast and, right. and wherever you can. Which That's is, exactly cool. right. Yes. Now, I really do enjoy, Chris, doing these podcasts because, you know, you have audiences, I have audiences, and the more people can hear of these conversations, I think it's going to help uh, be a win-win situation because, yeah. you know, as my, I don't have a brick and mortar store that people can drive by and stop in and ask questions, you know, so social media, podcasts, this is such the wave of the future to get this information out into our industry. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's the same thing, honestly, when you go solar, you know, the big thing we talk about is the best way to save money is to use less energy. And it applies on the back end as well. Use yeah. less waste, use less right. to create less waste. So kind of a full circle moment. Well, this has been a great conversation, Emily. Uh, thank you so much. Emily O'Leary, CEO of Green Clean Solar, uh, speaking to us from Georgia. And one qu question, how do you see the future of, of solar and, and I guess specifically recycling? Uh, where it's do you see gonna it going keep, in 10 years? It's going to keep growing. I mean, the conversations and, you know, the clients that we have, you know, we used to talk about megawatts. Now I have clients that are saying, hey, we have a gigawatt of portfolio. So it's yeah, just going to wow. grow. It's going to keep growing and growing. There's funding there. I talk to a lot of uh, financial institutions and they have money sitting there to give to all these uh, installers and developers. Yeah. So I, I just see that this is an industry that there is going to be amazing job growth, um, expanding in areas, you know, that we had never seen before. Um, so that's my take on the solar. And then as far as recycling, I know 100% that it is going to just grow as well. Like the conversations that I've been having, especially with all this technology that wants to come into the U.S. and they know there's literally case studies that will show how many panels are going to have to retire in you know, X mm. amount of years. So there's companies out there that are doing a lot of R&D right now, literally right now to be prepared for that mm -hmm. snowball or this avalanche of solar panels. Yeah. Well, and, and 
we have to look at what's existing already because at some point we're still mining and, and that's going to run out at some point. And, and obviously we need to do our part for climate change. And, and so 100% it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. And, and as the industry grows, we want to see more women. That's right. <laughs> Bring them on. That's right. I love it. Well, Emily, thank you so much again for joining the Solar PV Cast. Once again, this is Emily O'Leary from Green Clean Solar. Um, website, give us a website. It's simple, greenclean-solar.com. There it is, perfect. And follow me on LinkedIn too, because oh, I yes. put a lot of pictures and stories up there as well. In fact, shout out to your LinkedIn, because that's how I, a friend of mine, a colleague was mine, oh, you should chat to Emily. She's great on LinkedIn. So uh, appreciate yes. it to Steve, and then shout out for you for, for joining us. Thanks again, awesome. Emily. Thank you. Have a great day. The Solar PV Cast by Shift with Chris Palliser. To begin your solar journey, visit shift.ca.